Hey everyone, we're super excited to present the AI Native Database podcast series. We've invited some incredible people to discuss where these new advances in generative AI are taking us and the role that database systems will play in it. This series contains four interviews with Andy Pavlo, Paul Groth, John Maida, and Dan Shipper. All four podcasts feature WeVA co-founder and CEO, Bob Van Light. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoy the series. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching another episode of the WeVA podcast in our special edition series featuring WeVA co-founder Bob Van Light exploring the future of databases, how all these recent trends in AI is going to shape the future of databases. I can't even tell you how excited I am to welcome Andy Pavlo to the WeVA podcast. Andy is the co-founder of AutoTune, pioneering the self-driving database system. Such an exciting idea around using machine learning models to tune database systems, uh, maximize latency and throughput, all sorts of things we'll get into in the podcast. Um, Andy is also a professor of databases at Carnegie Mellon, where in my view, and I'm sure shared by many others, he's put together one of the uh, world's greatest resources for learning about databases, including a recurring series where he has industry experts give talks. Uh, such as this year, our WeVA CTO, Eddie and Dillocker, joined the, uh, the series. And so, Andy, I can't imagine a better guest in our series with Bob on exploring the future of databases. Thank you so much for joining our, our, joining our podcast. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's about databases. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here indeed. Yes. And so to set a stage a little bit, so we, we do these, um, this, this mini series, right? So where we talk with people um, about the role of um, uh, ML or AI, yeah? we use it interchangeably, on databases. And one of the things that, that started to happen was that, of course, vector databases like, um, uh, started to play a role in the whole, uh, uh, in the wake of, of generative models for the retrieval uh, augmented generation use cases. Of course, we had semantic search capabilities and those kind of things. However, uh, some people also started to argue maybe the future of the database because of what's happening now in AI and machine learning is um, not a database as we know it today. Maybe we can somehow capture the information in the weights that are stored in the models as well. And the way that we talk about databases today might just completely changed, uh, change. And, and, and rather than us as a, a, a database company just you know, sit here and go like, nah, you know, probably won't happen in the coming years. Why not explore this publicly on a on a podcast with some of the experts like yourself, Andy, to see like where do we think this might you know be going? And is there some merit to that argument that people um, uh, are making? And I think as a as a first question to to kick off because there's a relation with machine learning um, uh, there as well. Can you explain a little bit in in from your perspective what is a self driving uh, database management system a system and what is the role of machine learning in such a system. Yeah, so I guess we have to sort of start from the beginning to define what a, a database mm. is, yes. data management system, and then define what does it mean to have a self, self-driving self database management system. So a database is this idea or this this repository information that's meant to, to model something in the real world. So for example, a university has students, students take classes, the classes get grades. And so a database could represent that aspect of the real world. Businesses have, have sort of similar models as well. And so a database management system is a class of software that is designed specifically to uh, store and retain and provide access to a, a database. So people oftentimes use the word interchangeably. So to be overly pedantic, you would say, you know, a database of the university could be run in a database system like Oracle, MySQL, or Postgres. And so the challenge with databases, especially if with relational systems, um, are really really any databases, but especially in relational systems. Um, the challenge is that the the database management system is sort of designed to be this general purpose uh, software that can sort of accommodate any type of database. You know, obviously there's data models and reasoning. We, we can ignore that for now. Um, but like the idea is that I could take Postgres and I could run my university database on it, or I could run my bank database on it, right? And the database system is, is meant to accommodate that, right? So it doesn't come with a predefined schema. And so the challenge is that when you abstract away the actual, uh, how the database system is going to physically store the data, and when you write queries, how those queries are actually going to be executed, like through something like SQL, uh, somebody has to make a decision, what's the best or optimal way to do all those operations? Like what's, you know, should I store my data as a row store, as a column store? Should I be compressed and so forth? And then for a SQL query, using that as an example, it's a declarative language. 
And so it's just saying, this is the answer I want. And it's up for the database system to figure out what's the best way to, uh, to, 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 you know, to execute it. Or what's the, how do you generate the query plan for it? And so this is a, a, a well-known problem, at least, again, focusing on relational databases going back to the 1970s. People realized very early on that uh, somebody's going to have to make a decision and you know, a human can do it to a certain extent, but for really challenging environments and applications, you'd want it to be automated. You want the database system to try to figure this stuff out automatically. So there's, again, a long line of research, uh, again, going back to like the 1970s. Actually, uh, one of my PhD's advisor, his advisor wrote one of the first papers on how to automatically pick indexes. And that was like in 1976. Um, so the, the various vendors that are out today, they all have some tools that, that the human DBAs or administrators or DevOps people can use to, to figure out how to, how to tune the system, um, like how to pick indexes, how to tune knobs. But the, it's still very, it's very much a manual process. And so our research at Carnegie Mellon on self-driving databases was looking at it from the perspective of if you had to build a brand new database system from scratch, knowing that it was going to be tuned automatically by an AI or machine learning algorithm, what would you do differently? How would you design the system differently? Because the way we interact with Postgres and MySQL and other database systems, we're going through APIs that are really meant for humans, like to look at query logs, look, uh, you know, the, the API methods you're, you're going to use to change things. Uh, and it may not be, you know, it's, you can build automated tools around it, but it's, there's certain things you maybe do in the inside that would be slightly different. And so we had uh, sort of two projects at, at Carnegie Mellon building a system from scratch in this space. Um, and I, you know, I thought we were making pretty good progress on it, but then through a combination of the, the pandemic, I then spun out a startup, startup with one of my PhD students, uh, Dana Van Aken, and then uh, I had a baby. Uh, so the combination of those three things sort of was a, was, a, was a trifecta of a bad idea or too much going on. So we ended up killing the project. Um, and so we took a lot of machine learning stuff that we were doing in those projects and then ported it over to, to Postgres. So it's not, Postgres, it's not, uh, like I said, there's, it's not designed to be tuned automatically by machine learning, but like we can get mm -hmm. pretty far with it. We do have to change some of the internals, which I can talk about to, to facilitate better, you know, machine learning operations. But um, that's sort of the big picture. The goal would be, can we build a database system and have it completely managed by uh, AI machine learning? And not require any human input. And that is a there. There's so many things to to unpack here. That that's so interesting. I, I you know I, I I made a couple of notes when you when you were when you were talking. So the the first one is the um, and this is something that I that I um, that I don't really understand. And there's like I I don't have an eloquent way of asking the question. So I'm just gonna blur it out. Why isn't that just one database? Why, where, where do we sit uh, in the, where do we, where do we get, where do we get, is it, is that on the, from the outside in, from a developer experience perspective, or does that sit from an inside out perspective on the indices? So that the way that we structure the database, the way that we, that we sort those kind of things, because for example, you mentioned in your example, you mentioned compression, right? So we use compression or not those kind of things, but, um, you know, um, uh, um, one could argue like, well, you know, that's something we could turn on or turn off, right? So we could say like, we, we add this to the database and compression. So and a simple example is in the factory index, we have a brief date, right? So we have a PQ algorithm, you turn it on, you turn it off, right? So mm -hmm. where, 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 why does it, is it purely like a commercially driven thing or an experience thing? Or is it just from a, from a purely theoretical, maybe even philosophical point of view, could there be just one? Right, so that's a great question, and, and I think it's a combination of things. Um, and I would say also too, I one of my side projects is uh, I maintain this website that the databases of databases dbdb.io. It's like it's like an encyclopedia of every single database system I know about. And we're currently up to as of what November twenty twenty three, we're up to nine hundred fifty four. And I know there's a couple other ones I need to add there, uh, but like we're we're getting close to a thousand. And this is goes back, you know, the first databases to the nineteen sixties to today. Um, and so I, I think to answer your question, why isn't there just one database? I think it's a combination of three things. One is that the, uh, the, the programming environments evolve over time and people want sort of a database system that can sort of interact with whatever the, the, the new thing that they're building. So, you know, you think of like the late 80s, early 90s, 
object oriented programming, like C++ and Smalltalk, that was the hot thing. So people were like, okay, well, I, I want a database system that stores C++ objects for me. And there was a whole sort of object oriented database movement for a while. Um, and then XML became a hot thing. And then there was a bunch of databases that could store XML. JSON was a hot thing. There were a bunch of databases that store, store JSON. Um, and so I think there's there's already sort of evolution of of sort of best practices of how people build applications that want to annex with the database. And that sort of pushes thing, things forward. And for better or worse, people start new database systems around that space. I think another aspect related to that is also the, the data model changes as well. I mean, object-oriented databases, that's one sort of data model. And then there's implementations of that. And so the, that thing, that evolves over time. And then the last one is, as you said, it's, it, it's, there's a lot of commercial activity in this space, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Like if you were a startup today and say, hey, I'm going to build a brand new operating system, whether it's a monolithic kernel or a, a micro kernel, like I'm, I'm going to replace Linux, mm -hmm. you know, as a general purpose operating system, that'd be very, very hard to get funding and actually do that. And it'd be a, a major, major un undertaking. But with databases, there's just so much money sloshing around and the, you know, systems like Postgres and others, like they're good, but like, you know, they, they, they definitely have their rough edges and people often feel like they can do better. I mean, you guys did this. You, you built a database system from scratch um, mm -hmm. to serve a new sort of class of applications that maybe didn't exist 10 years ago. Uh, and so I think that we're, I, I would say right now we're in the golden era of databases because there is so many uh, different options out there that are specialized towards different different workloads, different environments, different data models, different different kind of problems. Um, and and I don't see, I, I could see that tapering off a bit over time. Um, you know, so everyone's chasing the, 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 the Snowflake IPO. Who knows whether the market can sustain so many of these other, you know, sort of unicorns in that space. Uh, we'll see. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I think that the bar is lower, the bar of entry, bear, yeah, the bear of entry is lower to build a new database system and get people actually start using it versus like something like a brand new operating system. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good point, and I think it's it's fascinating. It's fascinating how that how that emerges and how that opportunity emerges, and that kind of also leads into my into my second question. And I need to I need to give a little bit of context to this because um, it has to do with the origin story of of Vivier because um, um, it's a long time ago. I I opened the uh, the GitHub repo for Vivier at the at the airport in San Francisco. Um, today, I can by no means take any credit for the awesomeness that's happening on the low-level stuff on the <laughs> on the database side. But the in, um, initially, what the idea was, um, uh, and it was like directly related to, to machine learning, was that um, I was intrigued by uh, the data modeling problem. And you just mentioned that you said, "Okay, we use a database to you know for real-world applications to uh, represent you know real-world uh, objects." or probably also actions, right? And I was fascinated by that. Mm -hmm. So I was there was a combination of machine learning, um, um, uh, um, things like schema.org for the semantic web played a role in that, just to get an understanding of how do we represent things. And one thing that I learned in my professional life was like, uh, the problem is the people. So uh, we as humans do not agree on how to call things. So. I was in a. Um, uh, I, I was I was hired by somebody um, back then. I, I was running my small uh, uh, software engineering um, uh, uh, consultancy, and I was hired by somebody. I was like, you know, early twenties, and I made this big proposal how we could in JSON represent something big in the organization. And the guy gave me an assignment, and he said, "I'm going to send you to three people in the organization. I believe from the top of my mind it was the marketing department, the sales department, and something else." And he said. Ask them how to represent a customer in your JSON model. He said, and if you figure that out, we'll implement it. So I went to uh, uh, to, to department one, and it, I was just super happy because they explained exactly to me what the definition of a customer was, and I could easily capture it in my JSON model. So then I went to the second department. It's like, well, we kind of disagree with this definition, right? So now I got into trouble now. When I got to the third department, I just, it was just, I couldn't do it, right? So the idea popped up, like, what if we would just take any definition that people use to define something in the uh, in the data model? So I didn't care if the sales department or the marketing department had a different way of representing, in this case, customer. But I would use vector space and the models to try to retrieve information as based on their similarity, right? So that was the original idea for um, uh, uh, for for Reviate. So like. Can we rather than have these strict relations 
that especially we're coming out like linked data, semantic web, those kind of things. Can we infer, infer them based on the models and, and, uh, um, and their relations? And the reason, so this leads into my question, because what I find fascinating, I also reread your paper about the, uh, about the, um, the self-driving um, uh, database. That then mm-hmm. talks about the database itself. So on a meta level, how do we interact with the database, right? So the scalability indices, those kind of things. But it doesn't say anything about the actual data in the database. And something that I'm starting to think about more and more what's happening in the space is that the models not only interact with the how we operate the database, but also the data that's actually in the database. So inferring relations, optimizing data, maybe even doing CRUD. Um, uh, you give it a prompt and there's like a, 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 a CRUD function that, that happens on the data itself. And I and this is kind of leading up to that question of like how the database is evolving. And I think the question is how do you see or do you see a trend in people building these systems like what we are doing? We're playing around with this too where the models start to interfere not only with the database itself, but also what's happening in the database, with how the world is modeled inside the database. When you say the, the models interfere, what, what, do you, like, what do you mean by that specifically? Yeah, so we, so, uh, and uh, uh, Connor wrote an amazing blog post about this, something we call generative feedback loops, where we basically, the model queries the database. In this case, it has Airbnb data in it, but it's missing descriptions. And we're basically, hey, you're, Abbreviate instance without descriptions, but we have like the name of the host, the price per night, the location. Um, take that information, generate a description with a factor embedding and store that back into the database, right? So where we yeah. can see use case. As I like to say, like in the in, in database world, the data world, we always had the, uh, uh, the saying uh, 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 shit in, shit out. But this is an opportunity to go from turn uh, chicken shit into chicken salad by basically yes. having the model and the database collaborate. And I'm just, I'm just curious how you look at that development in the space that the models start to interfere with what's in the database rather than the database itself. I wouldn't say it's interfering as a, like a negative thing, right? It's, it's, it's augmenting, right? Yes. Uh, and I think that for certain applications, absolutely, yes, this, this makes sense. To, to using your example, uh, of you know Airbnb, Airbnb rentals, you know it, it, the description may not be perfect, uh, but it's it's probably good enough, right? Um, for other things, especially when you start getting to like financial data, enterprise data, things get a little dicey because you can't easily explain why certain things happened, right? So you know, for example, if you're using uh, some kind of AI model that like is determining whether someone should get a loan for for a house. And it's spitting out you know, yes, yes or no answers, uh, and someone gets denied a loan. They're going to want to know why, and people, people would start complaining. So I think for some greenfield applications, this makes sense. For the uh, some of the more traditional brick and mortar things, I suspect that they're going to be more conservative. And we're in the early days of LLMs, and it's super fascinating. It's a very exciting field. I think the, the, there needs to be a little bit more structure and. and uh, explainability, accountability involved in these things. Um, but I definitely, I definitely like think that you can imagine, you know, using generative AI techniques to, as you said, to fill in missing data. Um, or I think another big space, of, I don't, I, this is not my research area, but I think using it for entity uh, resolution would be super important, right? Is, is, you know, Mike, Mike Smith and Michael Smith, are they the same people? Uh, just based on looking at the the names, uh, the fields of the uh, you know for, for you know a user in a in a database, just looking at the, the var chars, the raw strings, you may not be able to figure that out. But if there's additional semantics you can infer from the additional metadata about that person, then uh, you know a model could make a better decision about these things. And I think that's like super exciting. The problem is get, getting getting the training data for that is expensive and costly because it's not something you, you can always just outsource. Yeah. Yeah, sorry if I can dive in quickly. Um, a question I'm really curious about with Otter Tune and tuning the databases, and it's kind of related to generative feedback loops and having LLMs process the data. Is I'm curious if you're thinking about tuning the schemas. Like I feel like with data schemas, as as Bob mentioned, with how do we describe our customers? We have all these, you know, attributes we come up with. Um, do you think like LLMs can tune the schemas, and maybe this is evaluated for like either 
you know, accuracy in like a RAG sense or maybe just like latency throughput in the database sense? Yeah, I, uh, I have a demo video I've used for talks a little, for last year where we, we've tried GPT, ChatGPT4 to help it uh, like optimize the schema. And basically I took a, I took a, a schema of a real, real database uh, and I actually injected mistakes that I, that, that are like, that a human would be able to figure out. Like for example, um, it was a Postgres database. So you can, it, you know, if you name the, you, you can name a, a varchar column, a UUID and, and so, and you know, with a varchar 128, but it really should be the, the native UUID type. And you mm. sort of give the schema to ChatGPT and say, hey, you know, what are some mistakes in here? Or like there's duplicate indexes and things like that. Uh, and that has been pretty, uh, uh, the results are pretty inconclusive. Like sometimes it works, but oftentimes it actually doesn't. And I have to admit, we didn't do a lot of like, context engineering, prompt engineering, you really push it to try to, uh, you know, get better. And I know there was the, the recent update or announcement from OpenAI about, about additional context engineering you can do. I, we haven't played with any of that. Um, we do, we've also played with uh, we've also played with um, trying to use ChatGPT to infer or in, understand what the application actually is, right? Just based on the schema, um, and and also what ORM are they using? What, what does the application stack look like up above? Now, some of these things you actually don't need machine learning, right? It's some things are really obvious to figure out what ORM they're using. So, for example, using Django, like Django will name some tables like Django underscore. Right or like uh, SQLize or one of these ORM schema management tools, they'll put you know specific table names in. If you, so if you see that, you know what they're using. Um, but in, so that one, it could do it could figure out what ORM you're using for the most part. Uh, but it wasn't good at um, trying to decipher exactly what the you know what the application actually was. Because our our idea was if 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 we can say okay, well here's like ten categories of applications, like it's financial data. It's a, you know, it's a tech startup kind of thing. You know, are there optimizations we may want to apply uh, to, you know, from one category versus another? And could ChatGPT at least identify what category you belong in? Um, that we, have, we haven't played out. That hasn't worked out so much. Um, so I think, I think through better uh, prompt engineering, we could, do, we could get better schema, uh, you know, the, the schema optimizations. The challenge, though, is, though, because it's disconnected from the application, uh, and this goes back to why we want to know what the ORM is. Like, if it's if they're writing raw queries and they're like calling select mm. star on a table, and then we start reordering the schema, that's going to break a bunch of application code up above that maybe is assuming the offset of of columns. Or if you start doing things like let me let me normalize. Like I have this you know a table with a lot of columns. Let me break that out into subtables. Again, that's going to break a bunch of application code up above. Um, so you can imagine doing some kind of integration with like Copilot in Visual Studio GitHub, where you do have access to the application, can figure this out. Um, or Datadog yeah, has, 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 go ahead. Yeah, yeah. what I find so fascinating about this, and, and not to make it too esoteric, but I, I really find this fascinating, is that there's this, there seems to be this shift happening where that in, in the past, right, the, um, uh, the, the database was very was very binary, right? So if we if we if we take the um, in the feedback that it gave, so 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 let's take the self driving car analogy, right? So um, if you take a self driving car uh, um, and it drives from A to B, and it drives from A to B exactly how you set it out to do this, um, um, it's still very binary because it does it right or it does it wrong, right? That, there's like no. Uh, th th there's there's nothing in between there. So with in with the database, it's like this is how we define the schema. It's gonna eat it or not, right? It's gonna accept it or not. This is how we store the data. It's gonna accept it or not. But with the because of the the models, especially the generative models, we start to add this subjective element to how we're designing these systems to the model. So for the first time in history, it seems that we're starting to give away human subjectivity on how we define. A schema, how we store the data, how we represent the data to the model. So now it becomes not self-driving in back to the car analogy, as in I want to go from A to B, but you you insert subjective things, right? So drive me from A to B with the most beautiful scenery. And it's the model that that you know that determines what beautiful means in this context, right? And uh, or a beautiful scenery, and and this is what I find fascinating about the the use of these of these of these um, uh, uh, models because the 
it seems that we start to move towards systems where the system has an opinion how it needs to be designed or how it needs to be structured. And I'm just very fascinated what that what that might what that might lead to in the future because I could imagine for now if you look at a at a traditional database, right? So what do we what is the um, 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 us as a as a as a as a database provider or you as a as a professor to your students? What is the kind of the most important thing that you want people to give away? So you want to I guess the most important thing you want people to learn is like how do you build a reliable system, right? So it's reliable. Yes. But now this other element is added to it. Like how do we make sure that the, that the thing um, <laughs> you know does something? Yeah almost like ethically or morally agreeable in how we design our systems. I find that a fascinating, a fascinating development. And I, maybe, you know, better, but I think that's new or, or am I, am I, am I, am I wrong there? Um, yeah. It's, I, I think that, I mean, if you take like, like a traditional BI OLAP, you know, database system or even like an operational database system, right? Like for the most part, those are always producing pre precise answers. And then the the thing that changes is like how efficient could it be to actually execute those queries. Now there are like in some OLAP systems you can do approximate queries. Like you can take sam you can do samples and you you produce back something that has like here's some confidence interval. Um, but those are you know most of the major OLAP systems use those. But I suspect that most people don't know to like instead of calling count star call approximate count right because mm -hmm. um, you get back on some confidence interval and like humans just simply can't reason about those things. Um, so I think the semantic search stuff is 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 interesting. It's a natural progression, I think, from the exact search you would see in like text search engines, like a, a Vespa, Elasticsearch, Lucene kind of stuff, um, where now you you know instead of saying you know here's a you know find the exact keywords and things like that, it's like okay, well find me things that sort of smell like this. And then the challenge, of course, is like as you said, like it's very subjective. Like what we, what is good, what is bad, may differ from one person to another. Um, so I would say that the, and I, I'm not just saying this because I'm, I'm you know, it's, it's my job is to educate people how to build database systems, but like, I don't see database systems going away because at the end of the day, you, you need to collect information from the outside world. It's just now a different, a consumer is going to be these large language models. So I think, you know, the, the LLMs are augmenting our existing systems uh, for the better and not supplanting them. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's that's 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 a, um, um, a, a that, that that's a good point. And to, if we look at that, so one thing that I'm what I'm fascinated about is like, but in what direction, right? So to give, to to um, uh, um, to you know to give some more color to that to that point is the um, Connor recently did a podcast with uh, Patrick Lewis, right? So one of the 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 rack uh, inventors. And if you go to the to the hugging face on GitHub, if you go into the hugging face um, uh, repo. Somewhere you find hidden, you know, deep down below, you find hidden a, a folder that's called RAG. And um, uh, in there, they use libraries, so they use FACE, and then they have two models, two DPR models. And basically what happens is the, um, um, at the model um, uh, tries to do a, 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 a vector search on retrieval time, basically, right? Mm -hmm. so, so the model moves a little bit more towards, in this case, th this is a search library, but let's say for the sake of argument, the database. So the model moves in that example towards the database. So in that case, what you just said just really holds, right? We just need to have a very strong database that just needs to be supportive of, of these models. However, yeah. I'm also curious about if you see any trends or if you see any trends where it actually is the other way around. So that the database, the data layer is more starts to move towards the model. So that it, for example, becomes possible to, I don't know, to, to manipulate weights in, in, a, in, in such a way um, that we can reliably store information or can say something about the path, you know, that is being traveled through the weights to get to, 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 to a result, that basically we get this big blob, for, for like a better term, of, of binary weights that just stores our information. And yes, we need to run that reliably, but, you know, you could argue that if, if we're able to figure it out, it might be easier to just, you know, write, you know, run a big blob of, of binary weights rather than the complexities that sit in a database right now. So I think my question is like, could there be a potential future where it actually moves in the other direction, where we just start to see people more move towards the model and create database systems where, we, where they're going to go like, you know what, we're just going to store it 
we're going to try and distort it in the model itself. And to add one more thing to that, I um, and I don't know if you have this at hand, uh, Connor, but we were discussing this um, this paper uh, that we've seen, and I forgot the name. I believe it was Mehmet or something, where people uh, changed information weights in the database so that they, for example, said like um, I don't know LeBron James plays, and then it, it it fills in with basketball. But they were actually able to update the weights to change it to baseball, for example. Right. So as in the first step of saying that we can real time modify the quote unquote memory that's in the in the uh, in the model with, of course, the goal of storing information in there real time. So long winded question, but I'm just curious if you could see a future where it moves actually away from the databases we know today more into the model as it is today. So you can imagine or there's, there's two things. There's, there's the, I think there's a data market kind of approach where like, instead of selling, here's my raw CSV or Parquet files of data, here's some safe tensors file that you can just run uh, that, that, that it'll, that'll spit out answers for a particular uh, application domain. So you can imagine a world going, going like that. Um, and then to, to your point of like, could you build a database system to just using safe tensors as an example, like, could you build a database system around the manipulation and uh, accessing a safe tensors file, like the actual internals, not just using it, you know, within some like, PyTorch wrapper. Um, yeah, you you can you, you can think about something like that. And what's interesting is that, you know, instead again, just instead of treating the safe tensors file as a blob, okay, well, I actually understand what the bytes are actually telling me. And so the interesting thing about that is like it's a multi-dimensional array. Um, and relational database systems aren't really designed or do very well for all multidimensional arrays like that, right? There's row stores, there's column stores. Now, in the SQL standard in 2023, they just added support for, for multidimensional arrays that looks a lot like Rastaman's RQL language. Um, but I don't think, I think you would still need a, a sort of custom engine to be able to do that manipulation. Um, I mean, I don't know what the, and you guys might know better than I do, what the average size of a safe tensors file, but if you just look at something like Stable Diffusion, they're like eight gigs, they're 10 gigs, they're not, they're not massive, uh, so it'll, it'll e easily fit in memory. But I think over time, as the models obviously get much more sophisticated, the dimensionality of of these vectors increase. You can imagine start getting you know model files in, in the terabyte range, and so then in in there's the sort of like how do you expose an API and manipulate the the tensors file, but then the but how to manage that 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 data in memory and on disk? Well, that's just classic database systems. And so a lot of the same ideas that we use for, you know, systems for the last 30, 40, 50 years would apply in that same space as well. So I think like the management of, of moving data back and forth between disk and memory, that doesn't change whether it's a tensor file or a, you know a relational database system. But I think the API and how you manipulate it and how you access the the data within the file is, is going to change. Yeah, yeah, interesting, interesting. And the, what you mentioned about the API, so I, I would love to to double click on that as well. So um, I had recently had a very interesting conversation with somebody, and and that conversation was from the perspective of REST, because mm -hmm. um, um, I had to not make it too complex in the in the discussion. It's like the RESTful architecture is a nice way to just describe APIs and how we interact with our data and cross functionality and those kind of things. And one thing that we were discussing was that the um, um, the, 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 the status codes that we see, the, um, uh, the way that the API is designed and those kind of things is very much focused on humans, right? So humans connect um, uh, the APIs together. So what the, stat what the status code says, right? Or, or the, um, uh, uh, the way we define an, an object and those kind of things so is very human human centered, right? Obviously. Mm -hmm. And one of the, 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 um, um, the discussion topics that we had, and it was just an open discussion was like, would it be time to extend those kind of types of API architectures? Like for example, the RESTful architecture to actually have status codes, just to give you a very pragmatic example that you basically tell the receiving end, whatever you're going to send back is going to be processed by an LLM rather than by a human connecting the dots together. And an, an, an example use case for that might be that if you send a result back from a database, could be, for example, in a rack use case, right? If you send information back for a human uh, um, uh, to consume, so maybe products that you're searching through, you want to make sure that the ranking and those kind of things is done appropriately because you're going to represent it in an app on your website. 
But if you're actually going to send it into a generative model to get some insights out of that through the context window or, or however you do that, then it's helpful for the database to actually know the information that I'm going to send out is going to be consumed by a model rather than by a developer connecting the dots. So I think the question basically is like, do we need to rethink, in your opinion, the way that we now design APIs, how people, or maybe even go as far as like uh, uh, the SQL language itself? Because there, we might go to a future where it's not being written or consumed by humans or developers, but by LLMs doing something with the information coming from the database. I can't prove this, but I would say most of the output of a database queries is, is consumed by machines, not humans, right? And no, no, no from, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah just to make sure that what I, sorry, just, so just to make sure what I, what I meant. So um, um, I, I, I think absolutely the majority of, of um, API requests are processed by a machine. But what I mean is like, it's, it was a human that basically connected the two together. So the yes. output of the, of the API needed to be human readable to know how to represent it in the end application. Yes. But that's a bit of model not, we don't need to do that necessarily, right? So you can give way more information, more complex information, faster, those kind of things. That's not processable that a human can process to make those, uh, build those applications. But if the model produces the end application. So what you're describing is basically a projection in SQL in relation to algebra, right? You're defining what you want the output of a query to be. And so from the database system perspective, if there's a, you know, if there's additional information or different contacts or even different formatting or byte ordering or encoding scheme that you want to use because it's going to an LLM rather than, you know, some other Python code or something like that, right? Like, uh, then that's from the database system perspective, that's just a projection. Now, how many layers are in front of a, you know, a SQL query, what's REST or GraphQL or, you know, till you actually get to the consumer of the result? You know, from my perspective, as someone who focuses on database systems, I don't care, right? If you want mm. data encoded in a certain way, okay, well, again, that's a projection. I can build that in a, in a database system. And then it's up for whoever the application developer is to say, okay, well, I need this. I don't need this. And then you'll make a call t- into the data system appropriately. Again, that's the beauty of a declarative language like SQL, that you can tell the database system, here's the answer I want. I don't care how you produce it. This, but caveat, of course, bad query plans and all that kind of, you know, DBA problems. Like, I don't care what, a, I don't care how you produce it, but this is what I want it to be. And the database system's job is to go figure out how to get you that information. So absolutely, yes. If there's additional things that you think that would, would benefit data being assumed by an LLM versus, you know, a generic, you know, front end application, by all means. But then like, we, we, we can just add that to the database system as another projection output. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And I just want to quickly double click on something. Just it's a tiny sidestep, but I find this fascinating. Uh, and this is more um, a question to you as a teacher, right? So as a professor. Yes. So the the I was fascinated. You just um, described that how the database operates is something that you care about, right? But how mm-hmm. it's consumed, um, um, uh, 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 less so. However. The databases are complex systems. I mean, we, we work with a lot of developers and developers come in a, in a wide, you know, range of, of, of you know, um, you know, the, 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 the spectrum of knowledge that people have is very, very different. And I'm a big believer that we need to be able to help everybody to use the database, right? So we need to, be able to help yes. people. And that sits in the, in the, on the API level. So when they start to interact with the, with the database, do you, as a, as a, a the students that you have, I mean, I saw it also in, in HN's video, right? The questions that the, that the students ask, these are very smart people. They know how these systems work. They'll probably figure stuff out. What uh, is the, the stu- responsibility? I would say, yeah. this is why I love Carnegie Mellon. The students are smarter than I am. They don't know it yet. By the time they figure out, they graduate. And so I look like a genius. <laughs> yeah, but so the thing, what is, what is your, so you as a professor, b- yes. b- having people building these systems that are going to be crucial in it doesn't matter if it's in banking in healthcare and those kind of things what kind of what, what kind of responsibility do you take as a as a teacher to make sure that people understand that even how great the database is that people need to know how to operate it how to make the database work is there is there is there a responsibility there or is that is that too naive of a thought you know i i almost agree with you and that's sort of what the you know, what we tell students at the beginning, like we tell them like, look, 
you know, the class this semester is 150 students. Not all of them are going to go off into to various tech startups and and build actual database management systems. Most of them are going to pursue other applications, right, domains or other problem domains, you know, whether or not it's in computer science or not. And I tell them, like, look, the database is a really interesting thing because, like, no matter what field you're in, in the rest of your life, you're going to have to interact with a database system, whether it's like something like Excel, right? Because that's sort of a database, uh, or something like really huge, like a massive Snowflake, Redshift, Teradata installation, right? They're going to interact with the database. And what the what our courses try to provide is, you know, an understanding of actually what's going on on the inside, so that if, you know, if and when there is a problem, because there always will be database problems that they deal with in their application code, they can at least understand what the database system is trying to do for them, right? Mm. So that's 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 sort of that's a that's one big pillar of, of what my, I think my sort of my objective is, or my goal is with, with the courses that we teach. Um, and of course, again, there, then there's the advanced class and the, here's the kids that go off to the Amazons and Microsofts of the world and actually build database systems. So we go a bit more nitty gritty details, but the general sort of master's undergrad class is what's going on to your point. So yes, I, I do feel, feel like it's important. Uh, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of like you can only do so much in with research. So like how far, you know, sort of how far do I want to go up the application stack and how far I want to go down to the hardware, right? Like, do I actually want to be fabbing chips specifically to make my database go faster? It's interesting, uh, but it's, you know, it's not my sort of real focus. And same thing, like, do I want to be building an application framework at the very top that, that, mm. that can uh, interact with the database better than, you know, one way versus another? Uh, you know, the other two stuff we're doing is the, probably the highest we'd actually want to go to say, okay, well, we know a little bit about what the application is doing, but we're not trying to replace it. Yeah, I, I find that fascinating because the um, it's like on that intersection of how people start to interact with the with the database because of the models, right? It's just a we see that it, it's a different way of interacting, uh, and then on the other hand, you have, of course at the core where right, where you sit also, you know, what you teach the students at developing the database. But the um, the, the previous podcast we recorded in this in this series was with uh, we also had John Meda on from from Microsoft, where we actually talked about that, right? So what what how do we make sure that everybody understands how these new types of databases work to make sure that, that they understand what the implications are of adding AI and machine learning to, um, uh, uh, um, uh, to their data workflows. And, 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 you know, how do we make sure that people understand, yeah, basically what those implications are. So that's something I find extremely fascinating. And I'm also fascinated in where that, where that trade-off sits, right? So yes. we, we noticed that, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I would say another pillar, in, in addition to saying, like, you know, if you want to understand what's going on inside a database system, we teach that. But also, like, every 10 years, there's, there's another hype cycle on databases, as we talked about in the beginning, because there's a lot of money around and, and things evolve over time and people want to build new database systems. So I, I tell the students, you know, what they also can get out of the course is basically just a good BS meter to understand, like, when people come out and make wild claims about what their database can or cannot do, it, you know, they'll be in a better position to decide. Uh, you know, whether that's real or not. Now, I will say the, you know, I know you guys are building a vector database. The vector database is the current hype, right? Uh, I mean, you guys fully admit that. And it's yeah. it's similar to the NoSQL stuff of, of a decade ago. But I will say what's fascinating is I feel like the vector database people are more grounded uh, in about like, okay, here's, we're focusing on this, you know, one specific problem and we can do that really, really well. Whereas like the NoSQL guys are making all sorts of claims about why, Relational databases are stupid, slow, and old. You don't want to use SQL and all right, right? You don't want to use transactions. And they eventually learned that, okay, the things that they were avoiding are actually a good idea. And so the vector databases, I think you guys have done a better job at saying like, hey, we're, we're doing this one problem. We're doing it really well. And you, this is why you want a specialized system. But you, you still need your, you know, your relational, you know, database system in the front to collect the new data. So I, yeah, and so, so, go ahead, yes. Sorry. No, I just want to say, so, so one thing that, so this is something I'm thinking about a lot, right? So in, in, in my role in, in, um, in, in, in the company, it's like a, you think about, okay, how do we position a new database, right? So how do we explain to, in our case, we're open source. We also have a community, I would say, so a, we have users and, 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 and customers that, that, that they're not different when it comes from a, from a, a usage perspective. So they're part of our community. So how do you leverage your community or how what do you tell your community and and i'm if i try to peel off the onion and go to the center and see like what sits there and i can't help but going back to the index so you just go as deep as the index and the reason i bring that up is because 
one thing, and in all honesty, and I always, I, I, I'm always public about this. We kind of got lucky with this because I tell you, when when we started with this, it it was very obscure niche to work with vector embeddings, right? So, so the uh, but the 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 big difference between a NoSQL database. So, for example, yeah, well, any NoSQL database versus a a SQL database. It it at some point it becomes very hard to make an argument why you should use one thing over um, over another, right? And th- there are arguments, but they often sit at the fringes. But if you have a new data type, right, in this case, the vector embedding, you'll just take it from there. And that's where your argument starts, right? So you take it from there. I um, today it's not a, a, well, hold on. it's, it's oh, not sorry, a new data type, right? SQL's had SQL, I think SQL 2003 or 2002 added uh, single dimension arrays. That's a very good point. So I'll, uh, that's a good, a good point. So I'll, 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 I'll take that back where that, where that specific data type was the, um, the first class citizen in the database. So, and the index, say, that's, yeah. the, that's the key and then, and, 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 and the yes. API to, to, to do the similarity search. Exactly. So they were they were they were basically saying like so the so um, um, the example that I sometimes you know that I, that I sometimes give is like hey you know you have like for example it's full text search you know the strings text fields those kind of things then you got time series databases because you know if you want to do something there you have the NoSQL database for document stores those kind of things um, so every time there was like a something that was like in the index or or related to the data type we started to see, see new databases around that and one thing that we got lucky with in just in how AI uh, uh, or ML, right, took off, was that that vector embedding, and as you said, the index to 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 support real-time use cases just took off, made it, quote-unquote, easier to show this to the world. It's like, oh, no, it's just like, this is what we do, this is what we specialize in, and, and, um, and this is just, this is our expertise, and everything that comes around that right so the api interface even the content that we write right how we how we address uh, people that just became easier because we didn't have to um uh, um uh, we were not basically uh, uh um how should i say reinventing and and an, uh, uh, um a, a wheel so we didn't have to say it's like x but then open source or something like that right no 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 it was like really something we we started to build from scratch well, I think also too the the vector databases again. You guys aren't trying to replace operational exactly. databases, right? It's 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 almost again you're like a, a better elastic or Vespa, like like it's it's a it supplements what people already have. So in some ways, the barrier of entry is lower, right? Because it's not like you're trying to say, hey, you're running your bank off of Oracle or whatever. Get off that and use Weaviate. Because no one would do that because it, the risk is just way too high. Especially if, as a new database startup, like no one would, would say, I'm going to put my mission critical application. Like if, you know, if VV8 fails, the whole business grinds to a halt. You guys say, oh, no, no, like you still have your database record. We'll ingest it. We'll build the embedding. And then, we'll, then you know, we can supplement and do additional searches that you couldn't do before. So I think that's another difference between the NoSQL guys and you as well. Like you're not trying to say, as you said, just replace some of the existing, you know, uh, the, the, you know the existing infrastructure of, of companies. No, that, that that's true, and actually, so today, uh, the, the now recording this, um, uh, somebody from the um, um, uh, um, uh, Dev DevRel um, from from the Snowflake team um, uh, published a blog post, literally this, right? So you have your system of record, and that was then that was stored in in a, in a Snowflake instance, and then running Weaviate next to it to uh, to do searches and those kind of things. So that is that is correct, and that is a very different and different argument that you. So so for example. Um, I think most vector databases, I mean, goes for us, right? We're not transactional, right? And we're also not yes. aiming to be that. That's like a not, we're not focusing on that, right? So, so that's, that's a very good point. But I also think that the, that the, um, the way in how you position the database or how you invite developers to use it is that we're basically saying like, Hey, if you build st- stuff with all these AI models and you need like a, um, uh, something to store something stateful, right? Um, you can use us, right? So we, we help you with that. We make the model stateful. So that's a that's an argument that we have that I think is kind of new. So that's a, and that's something where I would say like that we kind of got lucky with, right? So because who knew that it would take off the way, uh, uh, the way it did. We just, I, I really don't think that anybody saw that coming. So again, like using the NoSQL 
systems example and when people say no i mean like you think of a json database like like mongo just yes. use them as an example you know their first five minute experience with using mongodb versus like a relational database system was is phenomenal right you just turn them on throw some json in you store it and i think yeah. it has better integration with people building web applications because the primary data is, is, is in json so I think you guys have done the same thing in, you know, WeVA, middle of us, Pinecone, a bunch of you guys, that the, you have better integration with the AI ecosystem than, yeah. you know, you know a, existing databases. The challenge, though, I think, uh, is that the, you know, the question is, is, is an index and that AI ecosystem, is that enough? Right? Is that a large enough moat? Um, yes. And, and I think over time, again, not... <laughs> It's your company, and but I'm telling you, you know, here's what I think is going to happen because we did, we just see the same pattern every ten years from the new category of data that's come around. Eventually, you'll have to support transactions. You'll probably have to support SQL. There'll probably be some standardization around on what a you know what the API, the query language would look like for these things, similar to how like, the, the graph databases are going through this now with GQL. So I think over time, th there's a lot of databases in the vector data space, uh, but the major ones will sort of stick around, the other ones will sort of fall to the wayside, but then you evolve to start doing all the things you don't do now. Yeah, exactly. And that is also, I mean, that is something that the, um, um, I mean, that I'm also, you know, public about that. That is also, by the way, that's also exciting about running a database startup is that that's exactly the thing you, that's what you figure out. So that's at my end of the, so the, the spectrum, what I do in, in a database company, that, that's exactly what you figure out, right? So how what long, is that? How, so, how, so how long do we be until we be at Sports SQL? To put you on the spot. <laughs> so, so, well, it's like, <laughs> that's a, now you're putting me on the spot. So it, 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 it the, um, I, 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 uh, that's very hard to say. I, that's, that's very hard to say because I, I, I still think that there's a way to actually bypass that. Right. And what I mean with bypassing is like, that's what I meant earlier to the model. So for example, um, the work uh, Connor you have been doing with Gorilla. Right, that is like a that we get to a way that it just doesn't that it doesn't matter anymore how you define uh, your your queries, but it just knows how to you know how to interact with the database. I I would not be surprised if that's something that we're gonna see. So that there's like this this layer on top of the database that whatever people feel comfortable with interacting with the database, right? That you basically write your query however you want to write it, and that it parses that in a way that it knows how to talk. To the um, uh, uh, to the database. So, for example, how you see that with us already is that um, now to the gRPC clients, the clients start to become more turn into drivers, where the, where, where mm -hmm. they really play a role of like they're they're not like a thing that's just written on the side to talk to the APIs, but it becomes a part of the database. How you interact with it, how it optimizes batching and those kind of things. I, I don't see why it should stop there without the interaction of, of the models, right? So that if that somebody could say, I prefer to use, in this specific case, Weaviate through uh, a language X or to, to uh, syntax Y, and that they could do that. I, I, am, I, I know that sounds a little bit futuristic, but I'm, I'm with the, the speed at which things are going and also the research that Connor has been publishing about with, the, with Gorilla and those kind of things, I would not be surprised that that that's actually a way where we're going, that we more have like a driver-like approach to interact with the database and that the user can be free in how he or she um, uh, um, prefers to query the database. So you, you basically tell me the same, like this is the NoSQL story 10 years ago. This Cassandra said the same, I'm serious. Cassandra said the same yeah. thing, right? Yeah. And then they, they, they're like, oh, you're, you're, yeah, you're using gRPC, but like they were using Thrift. Well, guess what? They, now they say you should be using CQL. Uh, I know the, the, the MongoDB co-founder, Elliot Horwitz, uh, you know, helped out with sponsor some of our research earlier at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he was, you know, 2012, he's like, oh, we're never going to support SQL. Mongo supports SQL as of 2021. So I think in five years, we be able to support SQL. No, okay, okay. So did, I'll take you, I'll take that bet. But yeah. the, um, uh, but the, um, uh, no, and, 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 and it's a good reason, right? Because if it's, you're successful, you're getting more customers and that's what you want. You want people using your database and then people start putting more data and it's like, okay, well, I want to hook up Tableau or MicroStrategy to this. Like it's good. It's a good problem to have. No, no, no. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is like more the, that I'm, that's what, so I think that the, so, so my, my, my response is kind of in between. So I think 
And again, this is very speculative, but I would not be surprised with all the research that we know that's coming out of combining the models with query languages, mm -hmm. that yes, in five years, people will be able to query v with SQL. But there's no SQL interface added to v itself. It's like it's the interaction with the models in between that have an, have an optimized way of interacting with the database and that the model knows how to. So Gorilla is an example of that, the research, right? So they know how to interact with the database through, for example, something like the gRPC endpoints. And basically, it's like a form of prompt engineering. You just give it whatever you want. So rather that I say um, that I have a RESTful endpoint that I do in Revit slash object slash whatever, right? Or I do select a, 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 a star from same collection name, whatever. Whatever I prefer to put in to that input prompt, the model will say, okay, I know, I understand what you what you need, and this is how I'm going to query Revit for you. That's what I meant. Yeah. So yes, yeah. they will use be able to use SQL, but I think we're moving away from purely implementing those kinds of languages in the database itself. Yeah, that, so this is another fascinating part of the sort of modern era databases as well is, is there's all this these middleware systems that sort of do these kind of translations that you're talking about. Now, right now, there's like, uh, you know, there's a, you know, there's a grammar file, there's a parser to take some query language and then convert it into another query language. Like it's very manual. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most systems, you know, you know, think of like there's front ends for like the Cypher graph query language to Postgres, right? There's a front end for that that, you know, takes it, takes the, parses the, the Cypher language and converts it to SQL. Uh, there's other things like for the MongoDB uh, query API. Uh, this is something I, to your point, that almost like I've been thinking about, could you build a uh, an LLM to be like the Rosetta Stone to take yes. any query language from any database and then have it spit out another one? The challenge, though, is when you start getting to weird like corner cases or like null semantics of like for one system, you know, the a, a query should perform a different way versus another. And then you start bringing in transactions because then you, know, you start like different isolation levels how things get updated, triggers, like it gets it gets really messy really quick. Um, the only work that I know in this space, there's a startup called Datometry that takes like Teradata SQL queries and converts it to like Azure queries. And they gave a talk with us at, the, at Carnegie Mellon a, a few years ago. And like, they go through all the different, like here's this corner case, here's that corner case. And I just wonder again, instead of human engineering this, could you just, is it possible to have like a, a giant training data set to say, okay, this SQL query to this SQL query and then build a model based on that? Or, you know, this query language to this query language. Exactly. And I, I, so, and again, I mean, because it's like, you know, we're, we're speculating about the future and I, I, and this is where that whole developer experience, um, um, you know, plays, plays a role is like the, I, I do have this ambition if we have a distribution of like the whole distribution of developers, right? So you have like this nice, it's the diffusion of innovations model, right? It's very similar to this bell curve, right? You have like the innovators, the early um, adopters, early majority, those kind of things. How can we reach everybody? Because if we like it or not, databases are complex for the majority of people, right? They, they, they need to go through a big learning curve, right? So, um, and I know that since since the beginning, like the dawn of, of of digital technology and storing information, there's this desire. I mean, look look at look at COBOL and those kind of things. How close can we get to human like? Um, but no, no, but like, but, but like, we already you see, have. You already have saturation. Yeah. You're at proliferation. Everybody has a cell phone. Everybody's on a, on web pages. They're interacting with databases. It's just so many. You know, you know, they're not writing raw SQL queries. And so I don't think. The the world should like I'd be honest like again as someone who like makes has my job or my 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 passion is like okay let me teach SQL and teach databases I fully admit like you know the average person probably doesn't need to be writing SQL query as a database and so it, it's going to be through various forms and interfaces it's sort of essentially what we have now and then there's things like ChatGPT and 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 other things where they're, they're natural languages you know, queries you can do right so I, I think we're here now it's just a matter of like. You know, do people know they're interacting with a relational database or the vector database? In some ways, that doesn't, like it doesn't matter. Yeah, so I, I'm not. It's a, I'm not sure about that because the the thing is this. So the 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 if you move to the stack, right? So the higher up you go in the stack, so let's take a bank for example. Bank is a great great example, right? So so you could argue that um, if I use the graphical user interface in the app 
on my bank to just look at my recent transactions, I'm querying the database, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying like, you know, show me transactions that happened yesterday, right? The problem though is that um, there seems to be this, um, um, it's almost, I think it's like a, it could be a law because we see it everywhere, right? Is that the higher we move up in the stack, the more abstract uh, uh, abstraction you take away from um, uh, um, querying the database. And the problem that emerges with that is that the use cases become narrower and narrower, right? So if I now say, let's say that my bank would give me access to just do SQL queries over the clusters that they have running, just for the sake of argument, right? To, to, um, uh, um, uh, uh, to see my transactions. The upside of what I get with that is that if I want to, I don't know, integrate it with the accounting system that I have, it's super easy because then I just write a little bit of code, right? And I uh, interact. But the, 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 the catch-22 is the easier we make it, uh, that we make it for people to use, e.g. the graphical user interface, the query, the more abstraction we lose where people can build other things with the databases um, uh, or with the data that they have as well. And if there's like a utopia where we can say it doesn't matter anymore you just tell what it, however you want to describe how abstract you want to become how detailed you want to it doesn't matter anymore you can even use human language to do this you can now interact with your data for example at the bank right so um my so my mom can do it just to see the transactions two days ago but i can use the same interface where the model sits in between there to for example connect it to my accounting software so the that is a problem that is unsolved. So the quote unquote easier we use, we make it to use the, the technology, the less abstraction and the less things we can do with it. I think that, uh, I think you're overestimating people's desires to do that, right? Uh, the average, again, just assuming the average person, right? Uh, I think that there's just, to your point, like humans are messy. Uh, interaction with computers is hard. And I think that having that, having certain restrictions or limitations sort of streamlines the things you know that people want to do most, you know, for the 99% of people. And then for the 1% that want to do deeper things, you know, uh, again, average person, not application developers, uh, you know, you know, is there better ways to expose the APIs to, to, yeah. to people to get what they need? Absolutely, yes. I don't know what the answer is. REST is not going away. GraphQL seems to be diminishing a bit. Um, but I think like unfettered access to data, is maybe, I don't know if that's what you're proposing, uh, is I think it'd be overwhelming for the average person. Right? Yeah, and, sure. So, may, so maybe going all the way to the graphical user interface is a little bit too far. But let's take, for example, um, uh, um, uh, GraphQL is a great example, right? So, I'm of the opinion um, um, that it, you know, if you want to use a graph database and you interact with it, right? So you like you write what is it, Cipher or something? That that's relatively complex, right? So I think one of the the reasons why, in my opinion, why, why GraphQL came up was because it just became easier to write a um, a, a graph-like um, a, um, a query. The problem, though, was that it came at a cost. It's, it's almost impossible to write um, uh, 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 many-to-many queries in, in GraphQL, right? So we even saw there was like a, a startup back in the day that started with a graph database that started with GraphQL. I was like, oh, boy, now we can't serve all the queries we want to serve. I believe they introduced something called <laughs> GraphQL plus minus, which broke all clients. Now we had another uh, developer experience problem. But the point I'm trying to make is that there seems to be this tendency that if we take abstraction away, and it doesn't have to go as far up as the um, as the graphical user interface, but if we every time we try to take abstraction away to make it easier for people to interact with their data, in this case in the database, that that comes at a cost that we can do less things. Um, that's that's just that's just something that I'm fascinated, and I hope that the models might be a way to overcome that. So, like you just you just describe the however you want. The more precise you want, or the more abstract you want, I'll try to figure out what you mean, right? So, for example, what you said in defining a schema that you did this experiment with the students with 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 ChatGPT, where you 
where you basically wrote a, um, um, a query and you asked um, uh, um, a chat GPT, is this, is this correct, right? Is this, is this SQL query correct? I think what might be an interesting experiment is actually saying like, if it knew what the mistake was and pointed out the mistake, that you ask the model basically, do you understand what I'm trying to achieve? And if it understands what you try to achieve, then even if you make a typo in your SQL query, it understands what you're trying to achieve, solves it, queries it, and sends you back the information. And it's like, yeah, you know, I, I, you, you made a typo, but it's fine. You, you know, you, 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 you forgot something somewhere, but it's like, uh, I understand what you mean. I got it from the database. I had to check the current schema, but you know, had a few, few, few feedback loops going back and forth between the model and database, and I understand what you mean. And if we go down that path. Then we can go further and further and further, and then we end all the way to the my my, my mom using the banking app uh, uh, in in how she wants to you know interact with it and with that in indirectly with the database. Uh, as a quick plug, uh, we had actually a speaker from Alibaba uh, for our seminar series this semester talk about they have a VLDB paper called Cat SQL that is a an LLM designed to do natural language to SQL that actually looks at the, the schema. Sort of as you said, and can I think can can correct things. What's actually interesting too is like it, it can learn things like I know that when you when you query this 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 table, even though you only ask maybe these two columns, I know that you're also going to need these other two columns because it, 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 that's the, it's the next thing it sees or something like that. So like it also gives you back data that you actually didn't even ask for and anticipates things you're going to need. I think so. I yeah. think I think I think this space is super new, super fascinating. Uh, I don't foresee people replacing application code entirely with natural languages. Uh, mm -hmm. I think preciseness matters a lot for, again, for certain applications. Um, but to your point, yeah, I think as a as a quick and dirty way to get start getting data out of systems, uh, natural language would be like a good first start because you can do things much more quickly than you know writing you know a hundred line SQL query. Exactly, and and I know it's a little bit of a contrarian view in the in the space, but I'm just excited. It's so exciting to see how people start, you know, try to reinvent systems, how people interact with um, uh, with machines and and with data in particular. So it's just something that I'm that I'm that I'm um, yeah, I'm very excited about. And I think also looking a little bit at the at the at the at the time because you're you're you know, it's I really appreciate uh, how much time you're giving us. But the, there's there's one more question from my side, and I don't know, Connor, maybe you also have some questions, but the um, what do you, what do you think, like, you know, what, what is the most exciting thing that you hope to see resolved in the coming five years in the, in the database landscape? What's the thing where you're like, for whatever reason, we still haven't figured it out. Hopefully like five or 10, whatever years from now, we will figure it out. And then maybe together with the models, maybe not, but I'm just very curious what you, what you hope the big you know, breakthrough in databases will be in the coming years? Um, so I, I would say, I think hardware is interesting um, just because focusing on analytics, the, you know, the way you would build a sort of modern, you know, OLAP data warehouse database system now is actually hasn't really changed that much since like Snowflake of 2012, right? Or even mm -hmm. before that vector wise uh, from the, the, the from CWI where they built DuckDB, um, like the core architecture is is more or less the the same, um, and so I'm actually curious to know like what's the new hardware on the horizon. I don't know what it is. Intel had a bunch of interesting projects that got canceled. Uh, there's some stuff with Risk Five coming out with additional accelerators, but I, I I'd be interested to know if like if there's some something new comes along that says okay we got to rethink everything. Um, persistent memory was I thought it was that like Intel's Optane. Uh, like I totally was all bought into that because you just changed the entire storage hierarchy of a database system, but Intel killed it, right? Uh, and I don't think anybody's going to try that, something in that space for 10, 15 years. Um, so I'd be, I'd be no, like on the computational side, I'd be interested to know like what's going to be the, the the next big thing that requires us to rethink database systems. I just, and at this point, I'm honest, I, I don't know what it is. Um, I think that the LLMs and vector indexes those are going to just going to be table stakes for any database system now. Um, you know, you guys have a head start. Pinecone has a head start over uh, other systems, but like, you know, since ChatGPT blew up in um, this time last year, so December twenty twenty two, like in 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 you know less than twelve months, less than a year, 
a lot of major databases have have vector databases, even Oracle notoriously, you know, is notoriously slow. Not because you know it, it, it's from software engineering perspective, but because they're it's an enterprise database system. You have to be cautious. Even they announced they have a. Um, so I think when that's was the last gonna... time? When was the last time that you saw such um, enthusiasm for new stuff in the database space? Yeah, so it'd be JSON, right? So Mongo, CalCDB, all that stuff, the NoSQL guys, that was the hot thing, late 2000s. And it took a while before the relational databases adopted, uh, you know, inc incorporated it in, in, their, in their systems, um, which is surprising because JSON looks a lot like XML and they all added support for XML in, in the 2000s. But like you say, like MongoDB blew up in like 2009, 2010. Postgres didn't add JSON until 2012. Uh, and the SQL standard didn't add JSON support or did JSON data types until 2016. So it took a long time. Whereas the vector index is like between the time like you know, ChatGPT blew up within you know six or seven months, a, a bunch of the major systems are now support for them. Um, so I think that you know things like Weave8 and 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 other vector databases, you guys are evolving over time to start doing more of the things that you know incumbent existing databases would actually look like. And so the lines will actually start to get more blurred. Right, you know that you that you guys potentially could become the database of record, and you may need to support transaction. You probably will support SQL, and and then so that's sort of one one perspective. And then the you know the Postgres of the world, they'll start adding support for for you know vector operations or similar similarity searches. I think um, I think standardization of what the API should be or the the, in the query language should be for vector searches. I think that would be nice to have resolved in five years. But the SQL standard is going to take a while. So like so just again, I'm just Predicting, so maybe twenty twenty eight, the SQL standard will now include uh, a vector, you know, ve vector support. But like by then, every all the various systems will have their own APIs and query language, and so there'll be a standard, but no one's going to follow it. Um, <laughs> as, uh, as, as we humans do, yeah, as we humans yes, do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. back to your question, like I think uh, it'd be nice to know in five years what the next big hardware thing is going to be, and uh, we have to rethink the design of database systems. Um, I'm. Uh, I'd like to see more automation in database systems, and again, not just because I have a startup in the space, but I think uh, I th I think there's a lot of unsolved problems, um, mm. and a lot of it isn't always machine learning. A lot is just interacting with humans, um, and so I, I think that would be interesting. Well, on the transactional database side, oftentimes you're limited by the speed of light because you have to communicate over wide area networks, and so there's, there's limitations which you, which you can actually do. Um, so I don't foresee any sort of groundbreaking fundamental changes to how you build our transactional database systems, I think it'll, mm -hmm. it'll, it'll be improved engineering. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. This was great. Yes. I would say also, second, I'm very excited about BPF. I think that's super fascinating as well. That like, like can you start putting BPF, EPPF in Linux kernel? Like, can you put, mm. uh, can you start putting app, uh, you know, uh, database logic inside of the, the OS kernel? And then, you can imagine in the future, we would have like a unikernel where you just have like, okay, here's a operating system that, that only runs a database system. And how much of that functionality yeah. can you push down in the kernel? I think that's another it, big trend you might see as well. It's so funny. It's just not, not to, not to, not to uh, uh, go down another rabbit hole, but I recently saw people started to argue or come up with ideas if, if a model could become a form of a kernel. So who knows? Maybe that's the way how things get connected together. But it's, a, it's exciting. There's like a lot of yes. stuff happening. People are creative and building a lot of new stuff. So it's just, it's just an amazing time. It's just, uh, I think that the, the most you know, joyful things are just that I can see so many people build new stuff. Low level, up and it doesn't matter everywhere. So it's like it's uh, it's exciting. So thanks again for for doing this. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. Yes, uh, uh, cool. amazing. Thank you both so much. Um, uh, Bob, I remember when we were talking in Croatia and you and we were talking about like who would be the ideal guest, and I was like, it'd be so amazing if we could have Andy Pavel on the podcast. And I can't believe here we are, and now we have this <laughs> podcast. And <laughs> Andy, thank you so much for joining. Oh, yeah, I'm just a, I'm just a regular dude. Just, I, I apologize for not scheduling sooner. I, like, it's the busy time of the semester, so like, it, it was bad timing. But like, uh, I, I apologize. I wasn't trying to blow you guys off. Please understand that. <laughs> no, no, but